I got into the study of sex and gender from a Christian perspective, really to figure out my own calling as a woman growing up in a conservative church where women weren't allowed to be behind the pulpit for anything except maybe singing a solo. No teaching, no preaching, everything was done by men. And I wanted to figure out how I could serve God where I wouldn't accidentally sin because I happened to have a woman's body. When I was in Bible college, I had two professors that I really respected. One of them told me, I want you to go and get your PhD and come back and be the first female faculty member in the Bible and theology department. Meanwhile, my Greek professor said that if I taught theology at the college level, I would be sinning, violating 1 Timothy 2, which says that women should not be teaching men. In seminary, I studied what theologians were writing about the theological significance of sex and gender differences, the different roles of men and women, and I found myself really dissatisfied with what they were writing. They seemed to be drawing these sweeping conclusions from stereotypes of maleness and femaleness, and none of it resonated with me as a woman studying theology. In my doctoral program, I began looking more closely at the science to see is there anything that we can say is true about all men and all women and all cultures throughout all of history? And that got me discovering some really interesting things. That there are some people for whom the question of maleness and femaleness is much more complicated. As I study the science, I learned there are people who have sex characteristics of both male and female in the same body whether it's at the chromosome level, or hormones, or the way their genitals develop, or secondary sex characteristics. Male and female is just so much more complicated than what I was taught in eighth grade biology class. As much as I had been harmed by Christian teaching about gender, there were people who'd been entirely written out of the story. And really, that's where my work began. One of the people in our documentary, whose name is Anunnaki, is an intersex person, and he told me that I was the first person to ever tell him that he was made in the image of God. My friend Leanne, who's also in the documentary, talks about how when she shared about her intersex condition and her medical history, the women in her Bible study said she had just ruined her testimony. I learned about how intersex people didn't feel at home in their churches, that they didn't feel welcome when they shared their stories, or parents who had intersex children who were afraid to tell people at church about their child's differences for fear of what they might think. And then I learned the ways that we've been trying to fix intersex people by doing surgeries on intersex infants and children to try to make their genitals appear more typically male or female. Parents and doctors have been doing this because they wanted to spare their children harm and difficulty growing up in the world. But over the decades, we've learned that these surgeries to try and normalize intersex kids actually cause lifelong harm, physical harm and psychological trauma. And so intersex people are really calling for the end of medically unnecessary surgeries against children. These surgeries and hormone therapies have been identified as human rights violations by the United Nations and been equated to torture. And yet they continue in the United States every day. As a theologian, I felt I had a responsibility to correct some of the Christian teaching about sex and gender so that we could talk about people as they exist in the world, not as these ideal stereotypes that we assume everyone needs to fit into. Christianity had caused so much harm, and I was hoping that the work that I could do could stop or at least mitigate some of that harm by educating the public and by helping the church understand that intersex people actually show up in the Bible. They're not a new phenomenon, and that's a surprise to most people. Intersex people may be as many as one to two percent of the human population, equivalent to the number of redheads there are in the world. Rare, but not uncommon. We all know redheads, and we probably all know people who have intersex traits, even if they don't share that information with us. Now some Christians will say, well, intersex people are just such a small number of the population, that shouldn't change what we think about male and female. And so they try to sweep intersex under the rug because it's so rare. But I think about Jesus's parable of the Good Shepherd who leaves the 99 and goes to look for the one. Jesus wasn't content to have 99% of his flock 
safe and sound in the sheep pen. Jesus wanted all. And so he goes out and he looks and finds the one who is missing and he brings that one back. And I think that's the obligation that we have as Christians, not to be content to minister to 99% of the population, but to make sure that all God's children know that they're loved. After I finished my doctoral studies, I went around the country speaking at churches and conferences, trying to educate people about human sex diversity, the experiences of intersex people. And even though those teaching times were effective, it became so much more effective when Leanne Simon, an intersex Christian woman, started working with me and we would go out together and she would share her story and then I would talk about the place of intersex people in the Bible and throughout Christian history and talk about how we can read the narrative of Adam and Eve in a way that there's also space for intersex people. And so I wanted to make the documentary because I knew I couldn't take Leanne to every single church in the country or every single conference and I thought she needs to be able to tell her story. People need to hear her story and need to hear the stories of other intersex Christians and so that's why we made the documentary Stories of Intersex and Faith which follows the experiences of five intersex people, four from conservative Christian traditions and one who's a conservative Jew and they share their stories. As audiences were able to engage with intersex people telling their own stories, we were able to move the conversation away from issues toward real human experience. Hearts are softened and conversations shift. After hearing the stories of intersex people, we can return to the Bible with new eyes to re-examine how we've understood the stories of Adam and Eve and where else we can see people who don't fit our categories showing up in the Bible and in church history. And this changes our conversation. As we were filming the documentary, I knew I also wanted to create materials for Christians. The documentary shares people's stories and a general understanding of what it's like to be an intersex person and an intersex religious person in the United States today. The curriculum goes farther, where we hear these stories, but they're broken up into six different segments. In each segment, I introduce the story, and then we hear the experiences of intersex people. We reflect on those as a group. And then I do some teaching on the science and on different scriptural passages that are relevant to the conversations about sex and gender today. The curriculum also has a leader's guide so that churches don't have to be experts to facilitate these conversations. It provides background information, summaries of the topics at hand, and also discussion questions. And even more importantly, teaches how we have careful conversations about issues that can feel very divisive. How do we do those well? So we also learn in the curriculum how to facilitate safe conversations. I'm hoping the curriculum and the documentary will help educate a wider audience about natural sex variation among human beings so that we're less afraid of diversity. I also hope that it will contribute to the work to end medically unnecessary surgeries on intersex children that are causing so much harm. Making it so that intersex people and intersex children and the parents of intersex kids can feel safe in their churches. I want us to get out from behind the culture war barricades where human beings are treated as pawns in political conversations rather than as precious human beings worthy of protection and worthy of love. Intersex people have a lot to teach us about other important conversations going on in our culture today. Around half of them also identify as LGBT or Q. Some intersex variations have a higher percentage of people who don't identify with the sex assigned at birth, and others show a high incidence of people who identify as lesbian or gay later in life. The science points toward biological influence on sexual orientation and gender identity, and these are important conversations that churches are having. I'm so grateful for my intersex friends who had the courage to share their stories. Their stories have changed my life, they've changed the way I read the Bible, changed the way I interact with other people. And the stories I'm hearing from churches who are hearing these stories through the documentary and the curriculum is that they are having different kinds of conversations than they were before, and they're just so grateful.